The overarching issue or threat, I would say, is humans. The things that humans do to the landscape, any change in the landscape are, are threats to wildlife connectivity, migrations, ecological function, fragmentation through land developments, highways, you name it. There are many threats, but the, all of them are habitat related and I think the driving factor here is human cost. When we think about protecting wildlife and wildlife movements, wildlife connectivity, we really need to look at the landscape through the eyes of wildlife. So what that means is, do we need to build an overpass on a roadway or highway? Do we need to build an underpass? Do we need to put in place wildlife-friendly fencing? Do we need to help landowners protect critical riparian stopover for game species, for example? Those are the kind of things we need to be thinking about. The uh, wildlife uh, in this country and around the world is very special to us. There's a spiritual ele element to it. There's a um, just a connection we have. But what we ought to be looking at is the greater ecosystem and where the wildlife fit in and is the ecosystem overall healthy. And what we're seeing right now uh, is our ecosystems are threatened. And we've got to act urgently uh, to protect it, and this is a part of it, is wildlife corridors legislation. It's not all of it, but it's an important part of it to help restore wildlife, bring them back, and restore the lands that they're a part of. So interestingly enough, states do a variety of things that help us with what we identify as wildlife corridors. But New Mexico is now the very first state in the country to have a statute that requires us to study, design, and implement wildlife corridors. And that's important because it means that we have a statewide strategy, it stays the course of time, it requires departments to work together, and it puts real money uh, at this issue. And now we're seeing other Western states and states pick up this leadership role and look for other mechanisms in their own states like Colorado to address this incredibly important issue. When we were doing the bill originally, when we had a draft, I got a call from the Wildlands Network in Colorado. They wanted to see the bill. They want to do it there. I had calls from people in Arizona. The Western Governors Association has this on their agenda. Recently, I signed an executive order that requires that as we're doing our planning, that means Department of Transportation, roads, it means where we're citing uh, extraction activities that we take into account, uh, big game migration corridors, and wildlife crossings with regards to our highways and roads. Our new governor, Michelle Lujan Grisham, is dedicated to working with other Western governors because wildlife corridors don't stop at state boundaries. They don't stop at country boundaries. Our wildlife doesn't know anything about politics. They're not Democrats or Republicans. They just want to live. I, I do feel there's bipartisan support because here you have Wyoming, which is one of the most conservative states, and they're taking a strong action uh, to uh, protect wildlife. And then you have states like New Hampshire, which I think are considered more purple, and New Mexico, which is blue. And here you have dramatic action by them in terms of legislation. But this work is just beginning. We also have a federal component to this action. Um, just because we've had some success in New Mexico and in Colorado does not mean that our work is done. What we're seeing is a part of our democracy where the states act first and build the groundwork for us to then do national legislation. I'm a proud co-sponsor of the Wildlife Corridors Conservation Act, which is a critical piece of legislation to connect these public lands that understands the, the flow, uh, the movement of these herds, of these animals, of these species, um, and not just animals, but also plants, and what it means to be able to protect these ecosystems.
One really good example of protecting a corridor for wildlife uh, very effectively was what's now known as the Path of the Pronghorn. The Wildlife Conservation Society worked with the Grand Teton National Park and the U.S. Forest Service to make that the first and to date only federally designated migration corridor in U.S. history. And the end result of that is that we continue to have pronghorn migrating into Grand Teton National Park. And if that corridor would have been lost, we would have lost pronghorn from that park. We then saw the state of Wyoming, uh, particularly the Department of Transportation, look at protecting that. And they put in $9.7 million in overpass and underpass structures to protect migrating pronghorn and mule deer along U.S. Highway 191 along the path of the pronghorn because of its designation. Well, there's many different kinds of wildlife crossings, right? We have overpasses, we have underpasses, we have exclusionary fencing, which means areas that wildlife can't cross, and then an area where they can cross that's often designated with signs. So depending on exactly what the geographic characteristics are of a particular area, there's a number of ways to do it. But the common element is it provides a way for wildlife to safely cross over highways and roads, reducing collisions, uh, saving human lives, reducing vehicular damage, and providing for safer ability for large game species and others to migrate. In 2007, we were working on the Tejetas Canyon Safe Passage Project, and this was the logical place to put our wildlife crossing. And it is the only Albuquerque open space property that is managed as a wildlife corridor. Along with the fencing, this canyon funnels wildlife down to our at-grade wildlife crossing over Old Route 66. They can drop down into Tejetas Arroyo, which is just below us here, and get water for their daily needs or they can move on down to Tejetas Arroyo and go under I-40 at a big bridge, and it essentially connects the Sandia Mountains with the Manzano Mountains. Basically a win-win situation because it reduces collisions, so it increases safety for motorists. So the question about what we do about wildlife, how we conserve wildlife and wild places is a really interesting question for us to all sort of contemplate. What can we do? And there's so many things we can do. We can get involved at a very, very local scale. We can restore watersheds. We can plant pollinator gardens. And we can get involved at the federal level and be actively lobbying our congressmen and women to pass corridor legislation, to put in place conservation plans, we can be involved that whole scale and really where we're most comfortable. In your own house and in your own neighborhood, you can do a lot. People talk about butterfly gardens, putting out uh, a little bit of water. If you own private land and uh, you're approached by a government to say, you know, you're in a wildlife corridor, would you help out? You should help out because it makes a difference to the entire ecosystem. I encourage everyone to get involved and to join a, a nonprofit organization. Show up to meetings, show up to forest planning, BLM planning. Um, let your voice be heard because these are your agencies, whether they're federal or state wildlife and land management agencies. One thing that's missing in, in this country a lot is community. And I think that's why we become islands to ourselves. And that kind of lessens who we are in regards to preserving things in a holy way. We are part of a larger community, or you can say we're part of a larger e ecosystem. We get services from that ecosystem. That ecosystem being healthy helps us be healthy as human beings. And when we start thinking that way, we're in a whole different place. Working a friend to friend, neighbor to neighbor, and across state lines, across America, our work is just beginning, and you're gonna be the difference that makes this happen.